share my screen. Is that coming through all good? I've got it, yep. Okay, wonderful. Okay, well, hello everyone, um, and thank you for that uh, introduction as well. So uh, my name's Zach Munn, and it's an absolute pleasure to be here to talk to you all about uh, scoping reviews. Um, uh, I'm very interested in all types of evidence synthesis and scoping reviews are seemingly incredibly popular at the moment. So it's really, uh, really great to be able to spend this time with you all today to discuss scoping reviews uh, and hopefully to have a good uh, discussion after this presentation as well. Now, I am currently located in Adelaide, South Australia. Uh, it's uh, half past nine at night. So good evening to you all, but also good morning and good afternoon to you all as well. And I would just like to acknowledge that here in Adelaide, in, in South Australia, I'm situated on the traditional lands of the Kaurna people. Uh, and the land I'm on always was and always will be Aboriginal land. And I'd just like to pay respect um, to the Kaurna people and acknowledge their relationship with country. So I think Joanna's mentioned most of these already, but uh, a few of the hats that I wear and potential uh, disclosures um, or conflicts of interest that I should mention uh, that I do have a role at JBI. Uh, I also have a, uh, I'm also the director of the JBI Lake Grade Centre and the chair of the Guidelines International Network. Uh, I'm also a part of a JBI Scoping Review Methods Group. And I'd like to acknowledge uh, the work of the Methods Group and all of the contributors to the Methods Group who has been spending getting close to 10 years now working on scoping review methods and, and particular thanks to our chair, Andrea Trico and co-convener, uh, Danielle Pollock. So I'm a systematic review and guideline development or implementation methodologist. That's how I, how I normally describe myself uh, nowadays. But one thing um, you might not be aware of is I'm not necessarily an advocate for, for scoping reviews. Uh, even though I'm giving the talk today or tonight, um, I actually spend a lot of my time convincing people or a considerable amount of my time trying to convince people that actually a scoping review approach isn't the best approach for them or, or the way they should go about answering their question. And I'm going to get into this a little bit later on. Uh, uh, but I just wanted to highlight that a lot of the time I'm actually trying to tell people, well, a scoping review isn't right for you. You need to do a systematic review instead or a qualitative evidence synthesis or, so, or some other approach um, because we're seeing, I think, a lot of people doing scoping reviews perhaps for the wrong reasons at the moment. And hopefully by the end of this talk, um, you'll have a better understanding of when and when not to do a scoping review. So what we'll be discussing today is we'll start off with a bit of a overview of evidence synthesis and I realize I'm probably preaching to the choir here but we'll situate ourselves in the broader field of evidence synthesis before we get into scoping reviews and just what scoping reviews are and actually a formal definition for scoping reviews. Uh, then we'll get on to this topic about when and when not to do a scoping review and how you can actually decide about what review approach is best for you. Uh, after we have this discussion, we're going to jump right into actually uh, some methodological guidance for scoping reviews and how we can do scoping reviews with a step-by-step -step approach and finishing off with some tips and tricks for uh, uh, scoping reviews. Right, so let's start off, uh, I guess, right from the beginning, uh, talking about the broader field of evidence synthesis itself. Now, there are quite a few definitions for evidence synthesis, um, but my favourite one, at least, is this one that comes from Evidence Synthesis International on their web pages, where they describe evidence synthesis as the interpretation of individual studies within the context of global knowledge for a given topic. These syntheses provide a rigorous and transparent knowledge base for translating research in decisions. As such, evidence syntheses can be thought of as a basic unit of knowledge using tools such as a policy brief or a clinical practice guidelines. And, and they go on to describe that evidence syntheses are the evidence-based in evidence-based medicine or evidence-based policy or evidence-based healthcare. And they really underpin um, um, this field and movement of evidence-based healthcare. And they also stress the importance of any evidence synthesis um, project making sure that they do follow transparent and rigorous methodology. So all evidence syntheses do need to follow this transparent and rigorous methodology for searching, selecting, appraising, analyzing, and assessing the strength of the evidence 
uh, uh, for the question that you're looking at in your evidence synthesis. So this, I think, is one of the nicest uh, and perhaps most comprehensive summaries of or definitions for evidence synthesis. So let's talk about this broad family of evidence synthesis. And what we know is that evidence synthesis as a field is evolving and growing and perhaps growing quite rapidly. And it's changed a lot over the last 10, 20 or 30 years. Historically, of course, we largely had just systematic reviews of interventions and perhaps even just systematic reviews of randomized controlled trials. But we saw the emergence of qualitative evidence synthesis and qualitative systematic reviews. Uh, we saw the emergence of realist synthesis uh, and other approaches as well. We started to get a bit meta and introduced umbrella reviews or overviews of reviews or systematic reviews of systematic reviews. And we're seeing a lot of different approaches come, come along as well, such as evidence gap maps, mixed methods reviews, scoping reviews, et cetera. And this is quite an evolving field. Um, you know, every, every few months, I think we're seeing um, some, some new term for an evidence synthesis project. And I was just on Twitter about an hour ago, and there was a discussion, I think, amongst some people about a horizontal systematic review and the terminology and what does that actually mean? And if we delve into actually just say one arm of this, of this family, um, uh, we can see that even when we talk about say systematic reviews, this can be broken down a lot further. And we have a lot of different types of just systematic reviews. And we could even get more granular if we wanted to say delving into um, prognostic systematic reviews that we could actually have uh, overall prognosis systematic reviews, prognostic factor systematic reviews and systematic reviews of prognostic models. So what we're seeing, once again, is this huge explosion in evidence synthesis methods. This can lead to a lot of confusion. And as part of my role in, in JBI, I've been involved uh, for many years in developing software for evidence synthesis and also running our training programs. And what we see is that a lot of people are really confused at the start of their journey. Um, and they just don't know what approach to choose um, when it comes to synthesizing the evidence for their particular question or objective. And this has really um, actually, uh, I guess, struck a chord with me in that what I really want to see is that people, people do the right review for the right purpose using the right methods for them. So that they're actually making a meaningful contribution to science and uh, making sure they're, that they've got the best chance to actually answer the question um, uh, in front of them. And also hopefully then reducing research waste and, and, and um, redundant effort. And that's really led a lot of, I guess, uh, I guess my career, trying to, trying to make it clear how people can actually choose what approach they should do and trying to come up with really good guidance for how to do different types of systematic reviews or evidence synthesis projects. Now, some of my colleagues have actually developed a really wonderful tool, um, this tool here, um, the Write Review tool, which, is, which was previously known as What Review is Right for You. Uh, uh, and this has been led by Andrew Tricco and others. And this is a really good starting point for anyone who is wanting to do some sort of literature review, systematic review, scoping review, or evidence synthesis project to really just make sure that they are going down the right path in the way that they actually choose their methodology. And that actually brings me to my first poll for today. So just wanting to get a little bit of an understanding about who's actually on the, on the call today. I'm just going to launch a first poll. And basically there's a couple of questions about your experience with, uh, with reviews and evidence synthesis. Um, I'm really wanting to know how many of you have done or contributed to a systematic review before. And then I'm really interested in how many of you have actually done a scoping review before, and if so, how, how many of these projects you have done. Uh, wonderful. I can see everybody uh, entering, uh, entering their results in the poll. I can also see that there's been some great, uh, great discussions and introductions in the chat, which is just fantastic. Thank you everyone for doing that. It's lovely to see and hear from you all and see where everyone's from. And wow, don't we have a, an international group on the line today. That's, that's absolutely superb. Uh, and I can see there's a couple of questions about the recording and uh, I'm sure Joanna will let us all know, but I, I do believe that will be up at some stage after um, this talk. 
Right, let's have a look. So I think ev uh, everyone's had about a minute to vote. I can still see people are still putting in their answers, but I'm going to end that poll now and I'm just going to share the results. So who have we got on the call today? We have, all right, so about 61%. So more than half of the people here have actually done a systematic review before. So um, we've got a relatively experienced group and gosh, there's 8% of you who have done more than 11 systematic reviews. That's awesome. You all deserve a medal. <laughs> Um, for those of you who have done more than 11, that is um, a large chunk of your life that you've devoted to evidence synthesis and I, I take my hat off to you. Now, it looks like less people have done a scoping review before, about 40%, uh, and um, not as many people have as much experience, which makes a lot of sense, which is why you're here. But it's also good for me to know at least that there are a lot of people who haven't done systematic reviews or scoping reviews on the call, so we can spend a bit of time laying the foundations um, today before we get too far advanced. Great, thank you everyone. All right, so that's my introduction to evidence synthesis. We're now going to jump into an introduction to scoping reviews. And um, one thing that we found in the scoping review uh, methods group is that there's a lot of different definitions that have been used for scoping reviews and a lot of people refer to scoping reviews in different ways. Uh, and there didn't seem to be a consistent or even a formal definition for what scoping reviews are. And this led, us, uh, led to us um, spending a bit of time and discussion and consultation uh, where we wanted to actually come up with a formal um, formal definition, which uh, we all we all agreed with and approved um, amongst our group. And we've actually put this out there. So let's have a look at our definition. And what I want to do is I want to just highlight a few elements of this uh, definition um, in particular. Firstly, I want to just uh, I want to highlight that scoping reviews are a type of evidence synthesis. So we've defined now what evidence synthesis is. And I just want to stress that scoping reviews are a type of evidence synthesis. They sit within this evidence synthesis family. And because they do sit within this family, it means that um, uh, because they belong in this family, we should place the same expectations on scoping reviews as we would with any other uh, evidence synthesis project. Um, as such, they need to be conducted in a rigorous and transparent um, um, means and also um, be reported transparently as well. Now, uh, what do scoping reviews do? Well, scoping reviews can map the breadth of evidence available on a particular topic or field or issue, and sometimes irrespective of source or study design or across study designs. So scoping reviews can be used um, um, as a basis for evidence maps uh, and can help map the evidence or the research um, uh, on a particular field, topic or concept. But scoping reviews can also do a little bit more than that. They can also investigate and clarify key concepts and definitions in the literature and identify key characteristics or factors related to a concept, including those related to methodological research. And we're seeing scoping reviews um, increasingly being done uh, um, uh, to actually investigate uh, methods of studies and as part of methodological research as well. So, so they're quite a flexible approach. In terms of a history of scoping reviews, um, they have been around um, um, for a while now, but in the early days, there wasn't a lot of guidance um, or, or formal guidance at least uh, to reference if you were going to be conducting a scoping review. And in 2005, we had this uh, seminal paper from Arksky and O'Malley, uh, which really was the foundational framework for scoping reviews. And really all of the guidance um, that, has, uh, that has been developed since, including the guidance from JBI, um, has its, has its, um, has its, has its um, um, foundations within, within this guidance. Now, building upon that uh, guidance, Levac and colleagues in 2010 um, provided a bit more detail around the Arxi and O'Malley framework and provided a little bit more methodological guidance, but once again, invited further development of the scoping review uh, approach. And that led uh, uh, to us uh, really um, in about 2012, setting up the JBI scoping review methodology group, where we wanted to provide uh, basically a lot more detail about how you can actually do a scoping review, building upon the pre previous guidance and then getting, um, I guess, more granular in the actual um, 
um, and providing that actual step-by-step -step approach for scoping reviews. And the first, uh, the first uh, manual for scoping reviews was released back in 2014, but we've continued working on it over the years and we released an update in 2020. And um, if you follow our work, we're actually um, uh, um, releasing um, new papers and new guidance, uh, more detailed guidance um, um, continuously as well. It's not a, not a static methodology. And this leads me to my second poll now. I'm interested in what frameworks people are familiar with. This is just one question now, so it might not take as long. Um, but what, um, what frameworks are you uh, most familiar with? And I can see that this is actually a single choice rather than um, I don't think you can choose multiple options. So I guess put in the, the framework that you're most familiar with or perhaps you've used in the past. Uh, I can see that um, the popcorn is still popping. I can see a lot of people still putting in, putting in their, their votes. Uh, it's starting to slow down though. Um, we're not getting as many people putting them in. Um, we're not hearing as many pops of a popcorn. All right, let's, um, let's finish that up and I will share those results. What have we got here? So it looks like, um, it uh, looks like um, mainly people, uh, the, the, the most popular answer is that people haven't heard any, about any of the frameworks. So that's really, really interesting once again. Um, and it's great that you're here so you can start to learn about these. And then it's um, pretty close between the ARCSI and O'Malley and the JBI approaches. That's great. Well, I will stop sharing those results. Well, um, this brings me to basically um, our guidance and our resources. And you, we, what we have at JBI is we have our JBI Scoping Review Network, which is really, uh, it's a network where people can collaborate and interact and discuss scoping reviews. But it's also a repository of guidance and resources for scoping reviews. Um, so, so if you're interested in, in, in getting some help, um, please, please do Google JBI Scoping Review Network and you'll find this, this wonderful hub of activity and resources that you can refer to as you undertake your scoping review, uh, including some of our key publications and guidance. And the other uh, resource that I might point you to is uh, the JBI Manual for Evidence Synthesis. And I'll probably point you back to this a few times tonight. Uh, really, if you are looking for that really detailed guidance, if you are actually going to be doing a scoping review, I, I can't recommend enough that you read this, uh, read this chapter on scoping reviews within our Manual for Evidence Synthesis um, from cover to cover. But really, firstly, what we want to do or what we want to know is, is a scoping review actually right for us? And this can be a bit of a challenge. And what I want to get into now is when and when not to do a scoping review. And I want to start firstly by talking about what I've labelled the dark side of scoping reviews. And what, what I've seen in, in, in some of my time as an, as an editor, as a peer reviewer, as an educator, uh, as someone who works with a lot of different people who are doing um, systematic reviews and scoping reviews and other types of evidence synthesis, I've come across a lot of perhaps uh, misconceptions regarding scoping reviews, um, and sometimes let's say some abuses of, of scoping reviews, uh, and maybe even it, potentially some misconduct in terms of scoping reviews. And I wanted to highlight these issues mainly as red flags or warning signs um, to you all and to hopefully clarify some of these today as well. So what we see uh, a lot of the time is that people do scoping reviews because they think it's going to be uh, uh, basically a systematic review where you can just skip some steps and that you can uh, do it uh, uh, in a lot simpler and a lot easier than perhaps a systematic review. And what we actually see in a lot of the published scoping reviews is that really they can be a little bit of a mess. Um, and people haven't really conducted them um, appropriately, rigorously, transparently. And to me, it seems like perhaps these were just um, pretty straightforward, old style or classic literature reviews, and they've just slapped a scoping review label on it to perhaps make it sound a little bit better or to perhaps help it get published. And, you know, this is a real, real big worry. Uh, and this is some of the things that we're seeing with scoping reviews, lots of people skipping, skipping steps. Another thing that I've heard 
is that um, people are attracted to scoping reviews because of the methodological freedom within them and that there is no guidance for scoping reviews. And basically you can do what you want in a scoping review and get away with it. Or that people come to the end of a literature review, they're not sure what to call it, so they call it a scoping review. Uh, and I've actually had some conversations with people who weren't aware of, um, I guess, the field that I work in. And um, they've actually said these sort of statements to me, like, uh, we'll just we'll just have a bit of a look and see and call it call it a scoping review, or or why don't we call that that piece of work that we did a while ago a scoping review, just to make it sound a bit better. So these are once again some of the issues with with scoping reviews, and I think some of this has contributed to this this idea that scoping reviews are a lower form of evidence synthesis, uh, or perhaps a poor cousin of of systematic reviews. Um, but I'd like to stress that no, they're not. They're not a, a poor cousin. They're not a lower form of evidence synthesis. They just sit alongside um, other types of evidence synthesis and are conducted for alternative purposes. There's also perhaps a misconception that they're easier than systematic reviews, which is why I think some people are drawn into potentially doing a scoping review. Um, but I can I can guarantee this isn't this isn't necessarily the case. Um, uh, I know of some scoping reviews which have included, you know, 400, 500 studies, and they certainly weren't easy projects. Um, let, let me tell you that. Um, so this is not necessarily um, the case, and not necessarily easier. And I've also heard that scoping reviews can be done for any question, indication, or purpose. And I think this is because scoping reviews might be seen as a bit of a new toy on the shelf and people, people just want to get their hands on it and perhaps do it because I think once again, it might be um, a more simpler project to do. But, but the, the, the real truth is that scoping reviews aren't appropriate for many different questions or indications. And a lot of the time people should be doing perhaps a systematic review instead. Sometimes we're seeing people doing scoping reviews when really what they should be doing is a systematic review of interventions. Um, but basically, they're making the same claims in the scoping review um, as they would in a systematic review of interventions um, without any of that, I guess, rigor, that risk of bias assessment, that meta-analysis, et cetera, that you would see in a classic systematic review of interventions. And this is, this is a bit of a concern. This is, a, this is a funny one. We've also heard that um, because there are no or not many studies, a scoping review would be better. And then of course, we've also heard that because there are lots of studies, a scoping review may be better as well. We've heard both sides of this argument. Um, uh, and once again, I don't think it is necessarily about how many studies are available. I think it's more about what you're actually trying to do and trying to answer. And because of this, um, uh, if scoping reviews aren't done appropriately, if they're done poorly, if, they're, if, they're, if they do not adhere to methodological, methodological guidance and reporting standards, really all of this effort is contributing to research waste and, and it's a bit of a worry. And this wonderful paper um, um, just, just very, very recently came out, um, which is a, a, a methodological study looking at scoping reviews in the field of dentistry. And what they found from, from their review is that uh, the majority of studies, the majority of scoping reviews, didn't actually specify or, or justify why they were doing a scoping review. And uh, it was the scoping reviews were poorly reported, which obviously limits their, their use and perhaps uptake in the real world. And it seemed like a lot of people were doing scoping reviews who weren't actually aware of, of methods uh, to do that. So this is some of the dark side of scoping reviews. Now, it's not all doom and gloom, and I don't wanna rain on everyone's parade. There is a light side of scoping reviews as well. There is some good news. And um, what I wanna stress, and hopefully I've stressed already, is that there is methodological guidance and reporting standards available for, for scoping reviews. We can do good quality, trustworthy, rigorous scoping reviews. And we should do that by referring to JBI guidance, by referring to the PRISMA scoping review extension, et cetera. And when they are actually done appropriately, they can incre be incredibly useful. They can provide really valuable information to policymakers, to clinicians, to other decision makers, um, which can really, really help. Um, so they shouldn't be seen as this poor cousin uh, of other types of evidence synthesis. They just should be seen as part of this toolkit for evidence synthesis um, for particular purposes. Uh, they can be uh, 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 driven by pre-registered protocols and, and, and they, once again, they should be rigorous 
And as I've said, can be very useful for particular scenarios. And when they're done appropriately, they can actually contribute to reducing research waste because as part of uh, scoping reviews that perform that mapping exercise, you can actually really clearly identify previous research on the topic and also how that research was conducted, which could also help inform uh, the design of subsequent systematic reviews or subsequent primary research studies. And my wonderful colleague, um, Hanan Khalil uh, uh, and others actually wrote this really, really, uh, really interesting and useful commentary, uh, which was published in a journal of clinical epidemiology, which went into some of these challenges, some of this dark side, but also provided that light side as well, some of those solutions for scoping reviews including things like addressing the fact that some peer reviewers and editors don't understand scoping reviews, um, um, which can be a bit of an issue. So uh, putting that aside now, I think we've, we, uh, I think, and hopefully I've shown that there are some, some dangers of scoping reviews and some misconceptions, but when scoping reviews are done for the right reasons, they are incredibly powerful and incredibly valuable. So what are the right reasons? Well, once again, what, what, what perhaps drove me into my interest for scoping reviews was to make sure that scoping reviews were being done for the right reasons. And, and uh, we actually published this paper about when you should do a scoping review as opposed to a systematic review or other type of evidence synthesis. So we do scoping reviews to identify the types of available evidence in a given field. Uh, to clarify key concepts or definitions in the literature. Um, we can do it to examine how research is conducted on a certain topic or field, um, once again, perhaps to inform future research, uh, to, do, to identify key characteristics or factors related to a concept, perhaps as a precursor to a systematic review or a series of systematic reviews, and to identify and analyze knowledge gaps. And really we get into, in, in, in this article, what we really describe is that if you want to use your evidence synthesis to underpin uh, um, clinically meaningful uh, recommendations or to underpin uh, recommendations in a guideline, like a clinical practice guideline, or if it's about whether or not something actually works or is accurate or is appropriate or is feasible or is meaningful, then a systematic review is likely the most valid approach because only systematic reviews can um, uh, say with perhaps any, any certainty whether or not a treatment works or um, uh, whether or not a, a treatment is cost effective or not, or what is the actual experience of a particular condition or phenomenon, et cetera. And that's why we do systematic reviews. But if you're actually in interested in mapping the literature, if you're interested in forming future research, if you're interested in highlighting research gaps, then perhaps a scoping review is best for you. And we've even tried to make it even simpler with this, this flow chart, um, um, which, which walks through this sort of decision tree, I guess, about when you should perhaps do a scoping review and when you should do a systematic review. Now, there are some differences, obviously, between uh, scoping reviews, traditional literature reviews and systematic reviews in the methods. And I'll go into this in a little bit uh, more detail later. But you can see here that scoping reviews um, should, we believe, should still have a priori review protocol or a protocol that is created before you go on and do it. Um, unfortunately, at the moment, we, uh, Prospero doesn't um, accept um, uh, registration of scoping reviews. But ideally, you'd still be able to register your scoping review, perhaps on Open Science Framework or some other um, avenue. We should still have um, transparent and explicit searches, just like systematic reviews. We need standardized data extraction form. We don't do critical appraisal or risk of bias in scoping reviews, except in very, very rare scenarios. And this is because we're not trying to make those um, uh, uh, conclusions or, or recommendations, I guess, with any clear certainty about what is best or what works or what is the most accurate test, et cetera. We're just trying to give an idea of perhaps what's out there, what the literature is, et cetera. Uh, and as such, we don't have a grade approach or a summary of findings approach um, or grade evidence profile approach for scoping reviews like we do in systematic reviews. Now, um, what I'm going to do now is basically, it's a little bit of a pop quiz. Um, I don't know how else to, to describe it. I am going to launch a poll. And what I want to do is see, there's a few, few different questions there. And uh, I want to see what you all think would be the most appropriate approach 
all these different questions. Um, and obviously, you know, this, this would normally be up for debate if we were doing this in a classroom, um, but we'll, we'll see what everyone says online. I'll give you a little bit of time. And don't worry, it's all, it's all anonymous. So if you, if you don't get the answer that I would, I would have picked, that's perfectly fine as well. Um, um, no one else will know. So please, please do jump on and fill out that poll. I can see everyone's getting into it. Absolutely wonderful. Um, about half of you have done that now. You're all very, very quick. That's good. Let's have a look here. Okay, and it's looking like it's a very clever bunch um, online, which is very good. All right, uh, about 80% of people have voted. I'm, I'm just, and we've been going for about a minute. We might actually end that there and share these results. All right, let's see. What did people say? So this first question, what is the effectiveness of hand sanitizer in the reduction of absenteeism in school? Most people said systematic reviews, a few people said scoping reviews. In this case, I think systematic review would be the best approach. So you're looking at the effectiveness of hand sanitizer. You want to actually know what is the effect of this intervention in terms of this outcome absenteeism. Um, uh, and if we can say with any certainty, well, actually does hand sanitizer work or not? So I would say this is more your traditional systematic review of effectiveness or of an intervention. Question two, what types of measurement tools have been used to measure postnatal depression? Um, some of you have said systematic reviews. The majority have, it, have said scoping reviews. And in this case, I think scoping reviews would be the best, best, um, best approach as well. A scoping review would basically help you identify all the literature which had um, looked into measurement tools to, to actually measure postnatal depression. And basically you'd be able to come up with sort of this database or repository of all of the different tools um, that have been used to measure postnatal depression. Now, a scoping review won't necessarily tell you what are the best tools in terms of their psychometric properties or in terms of their, their accuracy. Um, if we wanted to actually look at the psychometric properties of a tool, um, we, would, we would do a, um, a systematic review of measurement properties. If we wanted to look at the accuracy of these uh, tools, we'd use a diagnostic test accuracy uh, um, systematic review approach. But because we just want to see what tools have been used and look at all the different tools, a scoping review is probably the best approach here. And the final one, what is the prevalence of malaria uh, infection in South Asia? Uh, here we've got um, more people saying systematic review once again, a few people saying scoping review. I think systematic review would be the best approach here because once again, we could do a systematic review of prevalence um, and we have met methods to do that. And we could eventually perhaps come up with some sort of synthesized estimate um, that we would be able to use and would be able to say the prevalence is, is X um, in this region. So that is really encouraging to see. I think a lot of people um, uh, 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 are able to distinguish what sort of questions are better for scoping reviews and what sort of questions are better for systematic reviews. So that's really great to see. Okay. All right, getting into my, my final um, section for today, I just wanna point you, point you all to some guidance and resources for scoping reviews. And we actually run training programs, we run you know, one, two and three day workshops on actually how to do systematic reviews and scoping reviews. And we're not going to be able to cover it all today. So I'm just going to helpfully signpost some, some, some major issues with the methods for scoping reviews and hopefully point you in the right direction um, for you to go on and do your scoping review. So what do we do? Well, the first step I think of any evidence synthesis project is really to consult with stakeholders. We wanna make sure that we are actually doing a scoping review that actually addresses the needs of stakeholders, decision makers and others, and that we're doing um, reviews that are going to have some sort of purpose um, and are going to be, going to be useful. Um, so it's always good to start off with, with this discussion, consultation and engagement. The next step is to decide if a scoping review is actually the best approach. And we've talked a lot about that today. Is, is, is your question, your objective, your aim, are they actually aligned to what you can do with a scoping review or should you be looking at some other approach like a systematic review? Then you've got to build the right team. You've got to have the right people around you to do a scoping review and a scoping review can't be done by one person. You need ideally um, 
um, two or more people involved in a screening and a selection, two or more people involved in the extraction, um, et cetera. So you really want to make sure you build this team around you uh, for your scoping review. Uh, and you can obviously uh, 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 look at the JBI guidance over here. Once we've done those first steps, we should develop a protocol. And protocols, as, you, as I'm sure you're all aware, are really, really useful because they help, um, they help reduce basically subjective or ad hoc decision making throughout the research project. And, and spending time getting your protocol right can actually help you and save you time in the long run because you know what you're doing, you know what steps you're following, um, you're not just making um, 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 random choices and decisions along the way, and you actually have a guide um, for what you're doing throughout your process. Um, once we've developed our protocol, we should register or publish our protocol, perhaps in a journal or perhaps on Open Science Framework, for example. And then, of course, you conduct your scoping review following, the, the, hopefully, the JBI or some other group's step-by-step um, -step guidance. And then you publish and disseminate your scoping review and ideally report it in line with a PRISMA extension for scoping reviews. So this is kind of what it looks like. Um, these are the steps. You have your protocol here, which talks about your objectives and questions, talks about your inclusion or eligibility criteria, and your planned approach in terms of your methods. And then you get into your actually conduct and your scoping review report, which is um, a report on all of these different steps within the scoping review process. Now, as I quickly mentioned, we talked about engagement. We've just um, put out a, a paper about how you can do this in scoping reviews, but it really is uh, very important. And we want to make sure we are doing reviews that will be useful to knowledge users or end users. In terms of scoping reviews, who might these knowledge users or end users be? Well, it depends. It depends what you're looking at. It might be other researchers. It might be policymakers. It might be clinicians. Um, uh, it might be the public. It might be patients, et cetera. It might depend a bit on your topic, but what we want to do is make sure we are including these knowledge users because they can provide a lot of useful advice, a lot of feedback and a lot of guidance along the way. and Also help contextualize um, and, and translate the results of your, of your scoping review. And this engagement should really occur throughout the whole scoping review process, right from you know, those early discussions all the way through to the report and dissemination. Now, you've probably all heard of PICO, um, which is the question framework we use for reviews of interventions. But for scoping reviews, we use the PCC framework. And this stands for Population, Concept and Context. And just like PICO, we find that this is a useful framework to help people to start to think about their scoping review question and to get it into a useful um, framework that they can then follow and guide their review. I'm just going to do a real whirlwind um, journey through some of our methods now. In terms of searching and selection in scoping review, it is actually very similar to systematic review searching. You have your eligibility criteria and you do your search across various databases. Uh, and we want to make sure that we are recording everything very, very clearly and, um, uh, and what we did so that we have an auditable research trail. Uh, and of course, we want to use our Prisma flowchart at the end. As we've mentioned earlier, we don't do critical appraisal, uh, but we still extract data. And data extraction uh, uh, should be detailed in the protocol. What are the items or elements that you're going to extract from the different studies or sources of evidence included in your scoping review? Um, but sometimes it might be iterative in scoping reviews as well. Sometimes you might actually find out that you need to um, add additional items to your data extraction throughout the process. Um, if this is the case, of course, you should always record this um, in your scoping review report. Ideally, this should be done in duplicate. Now, when it gets to analysing the evidence, we don't synthesise and analyse results in the same way as we do with other evidence synthesis projects. So we don't do a meta-analysis or a network meta-analysis, for example. Uh, uh, we also don't uh, use, um, say, uh, qualitative techniques like we would in, say, a meta-ethnography or a meta-aggregation. Um, in the same way as we would in qualitative research synthesis. We may use some sort of basic um, content analysis to help organise and group results, but we don't normally go um, any deeper than that, let's say. And basically what we're trying to do is normally uh, a lot of the time you just provide, say, frequency counts um, um, of, of data items that we've actually found and extracted um, uh, uh, and provide tables of the data.
of course, um, your methods are going to change depending on your topic and your, um, um, your choosing approach. Now, how do you present the results? Well, um, there's lots of uh, flexibility in, in the ways you do this. We don't just have a forest plot um, and that's it. Um, uh, and people have used some really wonderful, uh, wonderful uh, approaches to have a, 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 and very creative approaches to actually presenting the results. And these are just some examples of the way that people have actually presented results in scoping reviews. We have a traditional more sort of um, tables or cross tabs perhaps. Um, we have these sort of bubble plots as well. Um, word clouds we've seen, um, tables with frequency counts, pie charts, etc. And of course, um, online um, maps as well can be used. But there's a, I think there's a fair bit of flexibility and creativity that can be used at this point. And then, of course, we, uh, we finish it all up. We need our discussion and conclusion. And, and there may be implications of the findings for research and practice which should be stipulated uh, within this. So as I've mentioned, um, coming back to actually registering your protocol, we can't currently do it in Prospero, but we should still do it somehow. And if we can, we may even choose to publish it in a journal such as JBI Event Synthesis or perhaps BMJ Open, um, uh, F1000 or whatever it may be, whatever journal might actually take uh, our scoping review protocol. But we really wanna make sure that it is there guiding us um, a priori or beforehand. And once we have done our scoping review, we really should be referring to the PRISMA um, extension for scoping reviews. And this is basically a reporting standard for scoping reviews and, and details um, really uh, um, to a very, um, very granular level, what we should be including in our scoping review report. And this should really, um, really guide your write-up of your scoping review report. And before you submit your scoping review anywhere, you should double check um, this Prisma extension. And that's, um, that was led by Andrea Trico and is published in the Annals of Internal Medicine. So getting to the end of, of the talk today, and I just wanted to leave you with a few tips. Obviously, you haven't been able to delve right into the methods, but please do, as I've said, visit those resources that I've mentioned if you're looking for that really detailed step-by-step -step guidance. Firstly, a well-conducted scoping review does require at least two reviewers. You can't do it by yourself. I just want to hammer this point home. Do spend that time working on your protocol and discussing your question with different people, including perhaps methodologists and those who have done other types of evidence syntheses, um, because you want to make sure your scoping review is the best methodological choice. And even if you feel like you're treading water because you're not quite sure, it's better to really spend that time to discuss it and make sure you're going down the right path. Um, even if you feel like um, um, you're not getting anywhere. Spend that time reflecting, finding out about other approaches and making sure it is the best approach for you. Make sure that you have experts in the field of your scoping review, and if you can, experts in the review process as well. It's always incredibly useful, and I can't recommend including um, librarian or information scientist support enough in ev any evidence synthesis project. And ideally, you'd want them to be a part of a team and, and even an author on, on the scoping review because they provide such incredible information uh, and guidance and such a large contribution to it that I would recommend um, reaching out if you, if you have any um, librarians or information scientists you can access. Same goes with methodology support or those who have um, experience or understanding with scoping reviews or, or evidence synthesis in general. Think about the software you're going to use, you know, software for um, screening and selection, whether it's JBI summary or Covidence or Rayan or, or, or something else, and make sure you, you, you're familiar with and perhaps have training in that software. Make sure you, once again, you're including end users and engaging and consulting throughout the process. Um, and you may want to do some training in scoping review methodology. And there are some really good resources, um, once again, at our scoping review network, and there are some really good courses as well. And what you might want to do if you're going to go on and do a scoping review is join the JBI scoping review network. It's a very inclusive network. Come along to the site, sign up uh, and get involved. And um, we'd love to, love to have you as part of a network and work together to keep improving this methodology and to keep sharing knowledge amongst the network. But that is all I wanted to talk about today. And I hope we have some time now for some questions. And um, if you don't have time to answer your question 
uh, today, um, there's my email and my Twitter and you can always reach out and I'll be very happy to answer any questions um, afterwards. But I'm going to hand back to uh, Joanna now, I think.